right, so what are you going to do first off? Of course, we'll take derivative and then also take the second derivative, right? Yeah. So, <coughs> let's just get all that work out of the way. We should have, this is our first derivative, or this would be the cleaned up version. It'd be really useful to clean it up um, in order to take the second derivative. We can uh, make it take the second derivative uh, more simplistic, as simplistic as possible. Okay, then we take the second derivative, and we do all this work. Multiply it all out, we find like terms, factor it, cancel a factor of x squared minus 4 from the numerator and denominator, and wind up with the cleaner version. Okay. So that does take some time, clearly. Once we've done that, something that we should be able to do, we should have been able to take the second derivative from a long time ago. Okay? But now, what do we go from here? So it's the first derivative equal to zero, uh, which really we only need the numerator to be equal to zero. So we need x squared times x squared minus twelve equals zero. So x squared equals zero means x equals zero, or x squared minus twelve equals zero which there's no real number that will solve this equation, so. So we have, what's that? Oh, minus 12, did you see that? Yeah, okay, I'm sorry, I don't know what problem I was thinking. So x equals plus or minus the square root of 12, or plus or minus uh, 2 root 3. Oh. What? 2 root 3, yeah. Okay. That's what I just did. So x squared minus 12 equals 0. Silly me. Plus or minus 2 root 3. Okay, so oh we'll we'll deal with these oh, in a minute, but hey, what's the significance of these values? That's where there's possible extreme. Yeah. Possible extreme. Possible extreme. Okay. Uh, because the slope is zero and then the only place you can have a max or a min is where the slope is zero. Alright, so we did that. That happened. What should happen next? Second derivative. Second derivative. 8x times x squared plus 12 equals 0, because if the numerator equals 0, the whole thing is going to be equal to 0. Um, 8x equals 0, x equals 0. Maybe this is why I rushed through that other part so quickly, because now we have x squared plus 12 uh, equals 0, and there's no real number that's on that equation. So what's the significance of this value? So we have possible extrema, we have possible uh, points of inflection. Let's see what else we're supposed to label. Extrema, points of inflection, and asymptotes. <coughs> okay. Um, asymptotes meaning vertical asymptotes, horizontal asymptotes, or slant asymptotes. Okay. Well, are we going to have any vertical asymptotes first yes. off? Vertical asymptotes, yes, where? Plus or, plus, two. Two. plus or minus two. X squared minus four. If if the denominator equals zero, uh, then we're in trouble. We've got uh, a vertical asymptote. Is it definitely guaranteed that plus or minus two is going to be vertical asymptotes for sure? Vertical asymptotes. Is there another possibility? A hole, a hole is another possibility. If if plus or minus two causes the numerator to be zero as well. <laughs> Plus or minus two, neither one of them makes the numerator zero. So vertical asymptotes plus or minus two. This is fun. Very shaky. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, 
How about other asymptotes? So we're, what we're really talking about is end behavior. Horizontal. What is it? Is it going to be horizontal or is it going to be slant? The end behavior goes through infinity. If it's a horizontal asymptote, it's a horizontal asymptote. The, the value of y, the value of the function, goes off towards infinity and negative infinity, uh, depending on which direction you're going, which x direction you're going. Okay. You can see, if you put in a big value of x, this is going to be much bigger than this, and so the value goes off to infinity. It does not come down to 0. It does not come down to the number 5 or whatever. It just keeps getting bigger. Right? And if we take note that the degree of the numerator is one higher than the denominator, than the degree of the denominator there the, those conditions are perfect for a slant. How do we find that slant asymptote? By long division x cubed plus two to i x cubed divided by x squared minus four. Right. So we should put like a zero x squared here, zero x. So we have everything represented there. So what do we multiply x squared by to get x to the third? X. X. So we're going to put that guy right there. x times x squared is x to the third, just like we thought. x times negative 4 is negative 4x. Four okay. So if we subtract this, x cubed minus x cubed 0, 0 x squared minus 0 x squared minus 0. 0 x minus 4x is 4x. Minus a negative 4x is 4x. Okay? So we have a remainder of 4x. That means that the division gives us x plus 4x over x squared minus 4. Okay, what does that matter? What does that tell us? Slope is 1. What? Slope is 1. The slope of the slant asymptote is 1, and the y-intercept is 0, right? This right here is the, well, y equals this is the equation of our slant asymptote. And 4x over x squared is basically 0. Right, when x is big enough, it's basically 0, so we're just left with just whatever x was, which is 1. It's the slant of, it's the slope of 1, yeah. Um, okay, so like if, if we were to start graphing this, we know we've got a slant asymptote. With the equation y equals x, it's the equation of our slant asymptote. We know we have vertical asymptotes at plus and minus 2, plus 2 and minus 2. And all the other stuff that we have to do is finding those extrema, uh, possible extrema, those points of inflection. Right. So to do that, we use that little chart. Well, giant chart. Negative infinity up to what? Yeah. Up to negative, negative, two. Two. negative two root three. Negative square root twelve. That's what you meant. Negative two root three. Okay, and then we'll come up to the actual negative two root three. And then we'll look between negative two root three and what? And zero. Zero is also, you know, it, it's uh, of interest for the first and the second derivatives. So we have zero, and then we let x equals zero, and then we go, go between zero and positive two root three, and then x equals two root three, and then we're in that uh, We go from two root three to what? Square root of positive two. Positive. What? Positive two. That's we already have that marked as our vertical asymptote. This chart is for finding uh, points of inflection and extrema, really. And because it takes some amount of testing and figuring out, you know, 
is this an ex is this a, an extreme value? Is this a maximum? Is this a minimum? It helps to keep it organized in a little table. If you can keep it straight some other way, I welcome you to do that. But I think it's easiest this way. It's pretty foolproof. And when I grade your test, it's a little easier to follow. Uh, yeah, there's, well, there's where, that, where that happened. I see that. But when it's just customized to you, it, it's not wrong. But it certainly takes a lot longer for me to look at and grade. So just a little plug. If you want to make my life a little easier, you can do that. OK. Um, let's see. What, what could we? say is happening on this uh, interval. Well, we're not going to have a single value for f of x. Uh, but we can look at the values of uh, f prime and f double prime. This will tell us if it's increasing or decreasing. This will tell us if it's concave up, concave down. Got it. We could do that. We don't really have to. Right? We just want to know if we have extreme or have points of inflection. So we come here, x equals negative 2 root 3. So let's figure out what f of x equals when x equals negative 2 root 3. Do we know that? If we don't know it, we're going to have to calculate it. What's that? Because in the end, if it turns out to be a maximum or a minimum or a point of inflection, we're going to need to know what the y value of that point is. So let's find that y value. Pausing. Positive, 41.56. Yeah. OK, that works. Uh, what's the value of f prime at negative 2 root 3? Zero. zero. That's, what, that's why we found this negative 2 root 3 in the first place, because f prime is 0. OK. So that means we want to know if this point is what? A maximum. Yeah, if this is the location of a maximum or a minimum. Right? Possible, we okay, have f prime is 0, flat tangent line. Negative 41.56. Yeah. Oh. oh, wait. Never oh mind. my goodness. I Test meaning we're looking for is it concave up, is it concave down, is it positive or negative second derivative? Okay, so here's our second derivative negative 2 root 3, going in there, we got to be 12 to 24. Uh, be this, is, this would all be positive right here, right? Uh, no, wait, that would be a negative. So this would all, this would all be a negative. Three? Why would what? Yes. Squared. Squared, but not squared here. No, but I mean, it's like it's squared, and so the, the squared cancels out to be negative 12 plus 12. That's a square root of negative 12, negative square root of 12. Square. What we have here is negative square root of 12 squared. Okay. So we have negative root 12 times negative root 12, which would be positive 12. Plus 12 coming out. What? 12 coming out. Okay. This is just a simplified square root of 12. Part of the square root of four times square root of three. Right. Okay. So that's twelve plus twelve. That's twenty. That's positive. Then we have this negative two root three. So negative times positive. We got a negative up here. Down here, well, that's going to be positive uh, twelve, right? Minus four. So that's going to be positive. And the cube is still positive. So we got negative divided by positive. Negative. Negative. Concave down. Negative, that means concave down. Which means that we have what? What's our conclusion? At negative 2 root 3, we have a maximum. A maximum. maximum. The location of that maximum would be negative 2 root 3, comma, negative 5.2-ish. Anything so? Huh? 
well, let's see, we got negative 2 root 3. About how big is 2 root 3? 3.5. 3.6? A little bit bigger. Negative 3? 3. Okay. So here's negative 2, there's negative 3, negative 3 point. Close to 3.5. Uh, negative 5.2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So we're saying that's a, a maximum, which means that, well, it's approaching a vertical asymptote here. And it, it can't go up, can it? Because then that would be, well, it's really, I mean, I mean, it wouldn't be a maximum, right? If it, if it went up from there. And also, it would be concave up if it went up from there. It's not concave up, it's concave down, which is kind of what proves that it's a maximum in the first place. Okay. And it's just going to go down and uh, approach the vertical asymptote, but never touch it. You can't cross the vertical asymptote because its value of x is bad, bad, bad. Right? It causes the denominator to be zero in the original function. And then we come over here and we just get closer, closer and closer and closer to our slant asymptote. Questions about that little piece? I see question faces, but no question rounds. Positive and then positive, and then that's going to be negative, right? Negative. 
we all agree on negative there? Uh -huh. Yeah, but the negative one in there makes this negative. Okay, uh, negative one is a positive, we subtract, so this would be negative as well. Yes? Huh? Yeah. Okay, so negative by negative is positive, so we got a positive second derivative, which means concave up. All right, so if this is a point of inflection, then we need to have concave down on the other side. Put it in a one. Uh, positive, positive, put positive one, that's all positive. One minus four, that's negative three. So negative to the third, that's still negative. So it's negative, it's concave down. So what's our conclusion? Point of inflection at uh, zero, comma zero. Not to give you too many of these because it's not. I mean, even in calculus, 
it's just one of those skills we don't use a lot, actually sketching out a graph like this. Um, but it does put a lot of our skills to the test all at once in one place. Um, any questions about that one? Any questions about another homework problem? The next, or the, uh, the nice thing about this is it's like it was a rational function that somebody already did the long division on, right? So you got the, the whole part and the remainder part. So this tells us we have a slant asymptote. Y equals x is our slant asymptote. Have you got that going on? Wait, how did you know that? Or how do you know that? Well, the, the, the horizontal or the slant asymptote, you're going to have one or the other, you never have both. But the horizontal or the slant asymptote is what the function is going to look like at x is infinity and x is negative infinity. You can see this function right here is going to eventually a, approximate x. Just whatever value you put in for x, that's almost what you're going to get out of it because when x is very large, you're going to square it, and you're going to add 1. So this is going to be a very, very large number. I'm going to divide 4 by that very large number, meaning this is going to be almost negligible. It's going to be so small that whatever you put in for x is pretty much what you're going to get out. Does that make sense? Yeah. This part's going to be so small. It's not going to be much different from what x is, whatever that was. Mm -hmm. um, how about vertical asymptotes? Any vertical asymptotes? No. No vertical asymptotes. Cannot make the denominator 0 with any real numbers. Uh, so there's no vertical asymptotes, no holes. We can uh, just take note of that. It's all positive with squares. So it's like the root. What's that? Yeah. It, there's, it's all positive numbers with the square in the denominator. Yeah. So we can't add one to a positive number and get zero. Um, So now we should take the derivative. Is that? Um, you can look for x-intercepts if you want. Um, I don't put a big emphasis on that. I mean, it's going to, it is information that we could use, but it's going to cross the x-axis most likely if it needs to. Uh, And there's no vertical asymptote, so at some point it would have to. Um, so g prime, that's 1 plus, let's make this 4 times x squared plus 1 to the negative 1. Okay? Because that allows us to, I think, take the derivative a little bit more easily. Um, it's negative 4 times x squared plus 1 to the negative 2 times 2x. Use the uh, chain rule. So we bring down this power first times negative 
over the inside minus one from the exponent and then take the derivative of the inside. We're going to have to set this equal to zero. It's probably easier to get a common denominator and put these together. So 32x squared minus 8 times x squared plus 1. Set our first derivative equal to zero. The first derivative is right up there. One plus negative four uh, times x squared plus one to the negative two times two x equals zero.
use the uh, Yeah, but then to use factor by grouping, like we can use an x squared, and we'll get x squared plus 2. But then there's nothing to factor out of these two, and for that to work, we need the, the parentheses will line up with the identical. trying to get this to have an output of zero. Yeah. Okay. So what? Yeah, how do we do that? And you said go to the table? Well, that's a, that's a good question. Is it possible? Is there a way to quickly tell if it's possible? Solutions to this equation really quickly, visually, graphically. On a graph. On a graph. <laughs> well, let's let's take a look at the graph. Oh. Is the output of this function ever zero? Yes. Where? And zero. Zero. And zero. Here and here. How do we find those there's? Is this the derivative? Yes. It looks like right at zero. But that would make any sense. That looks but we can't just guess. We can't say it's like, I don't know, zero. How do you make it zero? Like if zero is that function. Can you what? Intersection with what? With the x axis. So how do we do that? Well, 
take forever on this one problem, and you guys don't even care, clearly, because you're not paying attention very well. Uh, at plus or minus root 3 over 3, which, how big is that? About the square root of 1 third. I got you. The square root of 1 over 3. 0.57. 
negative 0.57. 0.577. Take your homework now. To, to do fun stuff like that. Oh, no. But now we're going to do fun stuff like this. Uh, so, uh, Michael's about right. Great job. Okay. But he said using this much material, which would mean like using this much, say, aluminum. But for us, the amount of aluminum we use is going to be variable. What we want to do is contain the same amount of stuff, the same volume of stuff. So, volume is what we want to keep consistent. We want to see. Are the dimensions they're they're manufacturing these cans? Are they optimal? So I want you to think about you're a can manufacturer. What would optimal mean? If you want to contain this much volume, the same amount of stuff, what would be optimal? What, well, whatever costs you as, as little as possible, right? It's the most efficient, like the less material. Yes. So we want to keep our volume. We want to keep the same volume. We want to contain the same amount of uh, cut green beans. Okay, but we want to use the the smallest amount of aluminum possible. Okay. Now, in terms of if a if a yeah. Uh, well, we want to keep it a cylinder. Uh, the question of what's a more efficient shape, a cube, a rectangular prism, whatever, or a cylinder. A cylinder is better. Uh, basically, like the more sides you can have on your shape, the better. And a cylinder has like lots of sides, sides, right? If you consider these all to like, if you look at the, the, the plane that's tangent <laughs> to each, yeah. So that's a lot of sides. <laughs> Could you imagine having three forms? Now, what what shape would be even better than a cylinder? Sphere. 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 If we made sphere hands, then it'd be the it least efficient. But the efficiency of that for a manufacturer would probably be offset by the difficulty of making spheres. And the difficulty to open them. Open them and store them and all that kind of stuff. So we're going to leave it a cylinder. So we're going to see, hey, we're going to see if they are uh, being optimal or if they're not. If they need to change things a bit. Okay? So that's the, that's the task at hand. Um, I'm gonna say uh, each row is a group. Like this way? Yeah. Uh -oh. These rows like this? Sorry. Okay, so the four in the back there, the five in the middle, and the five in the front. All right? 
Go. Decide. These are the optimal, the optimal dimensions. And keep in mind, what we decide is optimal is that we use the least amount of aluminum. Oh, and I was going to say, now mathematically, considering a, a cylinder, okay, what does that mean? What do we want to be the smallest about the cylinder? So the surface area. Surface area. Yeah. So the total surface area should be as small as possible. Okay. So I'm going to give you like five, ten minutes. I don't expect you to have solved it by then, but to have made some progress and answered some questions, maybe written a function or two. What's that thing? I already signed up. That is high. It's a little over here. Well, we're deciding what the optimal size is, what the optimal dimensions are. It basically comes down to the optimal radius area for uh, or optimal diameter. Okay, so what's the volume of that? You have to decide that. Where's my paper? You've got the diameter, you've got the height. You can find the all that turn into some out here. I really don't want it like in ounces or whatever this is. Did I make it a snowflake? I'm looking at that right now. Okay. So we have this volume that has to stay consistent, right? It has to stay constant. So do we agree on what the volume is? What do you guys have for the volume? 3,302. 3,302. Okay, that's the volume. And that has to be the volume. That volume cannot change. So that's locked in. All right? So it's got to be that. Um, then we have this surface area which can change, we want it to change, we want to figure out what surface area is optimal. And by you know by implication what radius would be optimal. Okay, and what dimensions of the can would be optimal. We're trying to figure out what radius or what, what diameter and what height are optimal. Okay? So how do we calculate that surface area? Well, do we really care about what the surface area is right now? No. No. So how would we find the surface area? 2 pi r h. 2 pi r h plus 2 pi r squared. Because this part is just the surface area around the sides. And this 2 pi or pi r squared is the surface area of one of the, the the circles, and 2 pi r squared would be the, the surface area of both of the circles. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to erase those. All right. Uh, so if we know the radius and the height, then we can calculate the area. This would give us the area. Right. And, and what about the area do we want? We want it to be minimal. Minimal. We want, this is a function that tells us the area. We want the minimum value of the function, right? Does that sound familiar? We found minimums before? Of course. So if we could find a value that gave us the smallest area, okay, that, that would be great. So how would we go about doing that? Oh my god. Well, we can't set area to volume, because area equal to volume is not. Probably those. Um, so, if, if we have a function that we want to find the minimum for, what does that usually look like? How do we usually do that? What's the first derivative? You take the first derivative, and then we find where it's zero, right? So, you can imagine, like, let's think about the values of r, okay? And, and let's look at maybe the function of the, of the area, the area function. Uh, for a small enough radius, like a really, really small radius, like zero, a zero radius, how big is the area then? Radius. What's that? There's no radius here, zero radius. There's no area, there's no can at that point, right? So it definitely has a zero, okay? Then for some really big uh, radius, radius so big, that we've squashed the can down to nothing because the height is now nothing, right? Zero height. What's the area then? Zero. Zero. Okay. 
Now for a radius that's just a little bit bigger than zero, like a really, a really small radius, like half a centimeter, what do you think the area is going to be like there? Big or small? Big. Oh, the huge. Really, really tall sides. Yeah, really tall sides. Okay. How tall can we get those sides to be? Infinity. Infinity. Yeah. You get. You just let the radius approach zero. Just get close to zero, and h is just going to have to keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger to compensate and, and allow uh, you to hold that much volume, right? Yeah. Okay. So it seems like there's this huge, huge surface area that would be ter a terrible idea to build a can with a tiny, tiny radius and an infinitely large, almost infinitely large uh, height, right? So some really big heights are coming out of this can that has this almost zero radius, right? Uh, and then as we let the radius get bigger and bigger and bigger, how big can the radius get? Well, infinity. Infinity. Uh, yeah. So the now the radius is also getting to be very big. It seems. Okay. And somewhere in here is a is a realistic value of r. It's going to give us the smallest area. Maybe it's right there, right? And whatever the area, the surface area is, that's where we get the zero slope. So we see that, that that kind of makes sense, but if we try to take the derivative of this, what kind of problem do we run into? Two variables. Two variables. Yeah. The radius is changing and the height is changing, right? So that seems like this I don't know, D is a chain rule. Two different yeah. equations. Two different equations? Yeah. What do you mean? If you kept one, one variable constant. Yeah, but the radius can't stay constant while the height changes, right? If the height changes, the radius has to change because it has to hold that amount of cut green beans. Can you solve for h and then put that in for h? Solve for h and then put that in for h? So, like, if you solve oh, for h, you solve for h. Yeah, and then you put that in for h. Oh, solve for h in this equation and then put it back into this equation? That's going to cause you to get something that's obvious. It's going to always be true, but not, not significant. Not, but that's a good idea. Like, can we solve for h in a way that, like, can we solve for h in the volume? H in the volume one. What? I started doing that. Like the numbers, like I don't even know how to look at it. Well, let's let's start by just writing the equation for the volume. If you did right? use the volume formula, h would be a constant at that point. No, h and r can change, and the volume can stay can stay constant, right? Yeah. If I if I get grab the sides of this and stretch it out, change the radius, then the height's just going to change to make room for all the cut green beans, right? Make sense? Yeah. So we need our volume to stay at 3,302.108 cubic centimeters. But we're letting our height and our radius change, right? So given a radius and a height, how would we calculate this volume? Oh, well that's crazy. Not a specific height, a specific radius. We're letting the height and the radius be different, right? From what they are now. How do we calculate it if I give you an H and an R, what are you going to do with them to find the volume? Pi R squared. Pi R squared. Pi R squared H. Uh, yes. Yeah, that's the, the, the volume of or that's the, the, the equation of the volume. The point is the volume. Solve for H. So 33, 3302.108 over uh, pi r squared. That will give you H. Right? Yeah. If I tell you what the radius is, you can do this and figure out what the H would with the height have to be. Well, what happens if the radius is if, Well, that's not what I should have done. To should have circled this. If we plug this in for h, we got r. We got r in this. There's r there. There's only r. Okay. Yeah, I would definitely do it for h because h only comes up once. It's not squared. 
right? So the first power is the easiest thing to replace. Yeah, I figured that out like halfway through, and then I just like put my pencil over here. Well, that was pretty good. Really good idea. Um, so your homework is solve this problem, find the value, find that surface area, find the radius, find the height, whatever it is. Just get me online. Yeah, I'll post a video on this. Hey, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Post a video on notes online. Ooh, that's good. Yeah.